It's called Losing My Italian, The Lost Language of Love. When my parents hosted big Sunday dinners on Avenue B, much of the conversation was in the Sicilian dialect of their youth. Over anisette and almonds, my father, the postal clerk, became the carefree vagabond. My mother, the cafeteria worker, once more was the Belle of Pittston, PA. A word or a phrase I couldn't understand would trigger a round of laughter, a meaningful glance, or a resigned shrug. But when my father died, my mother became the last of her generation. She entered a retirement home. She told me she liked her new friends, but there was no one who spoke her dialect. I can't remember some of my words, she said. I'm losing my Italian. She didn't just lose words. She lost the private land we kids couldn't understand. It had a passport stamped with words and phrases from personal victories and hard-won lessons and folk wisdom from 50 years of marriage. The first stamp in my own passport was a joke. It was my first real date with Michael. He took me to Lutece, which was at the time New York's best restaurant. I was so impressed. On leaving, I asked him to translate a sign in French on the wall. He read, Liquor turns men into beasts, women into martyrs, and children into victims. <laughs> huh, I said. I'll drink to that. <laughs> and he laughed. And he laughed every time he mentioned it or asked me to say it, during date after date, until that phrase became shorthand for, you can say that again. <laughs> We were an unlikely couple. I grew up on the Lower East Side, a neighborhood he visited during his Ivy League college years to score pot. He was an agnostic, I was a Catholic. He was a skillful driver. He could drive while changing into a bathing suit. I didn't even have a license. What I had was a sense of humor that he enjoyed, enough so that despite all our differences, the next big stamp on our passports came at our wedding. The party was winding down. We'd been toasted, everyone had been fed. My Uncle Joe, with a glass of Asti Spumanti, looked thoughtfully at Angie, his wife of 50 years, and told Michael, you know, you gotta be willing to lose an argument. <laughs> From then on, when an argument went round and round, Michael would say, I'll do an Uncle Joe, and that was that. That was a big sacrifice for him because he would argue a point in a trivia game. <laughs> now, many of his catchphrases came from rock and roll lyrics, punchlines of jokes, or dialogue from underground comics. During every walk on a nice day, he'd say, nice day for something, which was his favorite Zap Comics character, the Checkered Demon. When we'd have to handle some troublesome issue, he'd say, release the hounds, just like Mr. Burns. He had a 14-year-old sense of humor, and I loved that, even when he pulled pranks. Like, one time he secretly programmed my computer so that when I turned it on, it would say, all right, Verge, let's boogie. And when I turned it on, I freaked, but it was hysterical. But my catchphrases came out of thin air. Things I said without thinking that made him laugh, just like the first, I'll drink to that. Other phrases linked to a certain time or place or event. They made sense to no one but us. If I said, it's like the broken window, it wouldn't mean a thing to you. But to us, it meant, it's no big thing. Don't even ask me to explain why Michael would call me Fungi. But some phrases were for comfort or amusement. Some were simply for the pleasure of recognition, joining dozens or hundreds of other tellings and hearings, times, places, and walks. Nice day for something. It calls up a memory or a joke in an instant. It's a pledge of allegiance to a private world. It's the impulse, grown up now, that all children have when they ask for the same bedtime story again and again. It really means much more. It means we're loved. It means 
we're in a safe and familiar place. It means, remember how this story goes? It means, there are no monsters here. Every so often, I'd say some random thing, and he'd laugh and say, that's one of Verge's greatest hits. I thought that was the best compliment. I felt so happy when he said that. Even more when he'd add one of his catchphrases. That's why I keep you around. After he was diagnosed with end-stage liver disease, we got a new one. It's just a bump in the road. We'd hit the same speed bump, heading for 95 South, when I drove us to the hospital for another meeting with the transplant team. He'd moved to Florida to improve his chances. I commuted back and forth because my work was in New York. And I was a very nervous driver. I couldn't even have the radio on. But for his sake, I drive for hours in the rain, Ugh. trying not to hyperventilate. That was my gift to him. And he finally learned patience in the car while I drove. That was his gift to me. It was a big one for him. He used teasing but soothing tones as we approached the speed bump on Summer Avenue with the sign that said, traffic calming. Okay, Virg, he'd say, calming, calming. I carefully maneuvered over the bump. Even when we were just going to the supermarket, an ordinary trip, he said it, and it soothed both of us. We're in a safe and familiar place. It's just a bump in the road. Came up more often as he battled each setback. His fighting spirit was forged as a Long Island wrestling champion. He pinned his illness to the mat time and again. But each time he got up, he left a little more behind. We were buying time until he got the transplant that meant health. I kept our go bags packed. But even at the worst of times, the scariest of times, I'd say some random thing and he would laugh. And he would look at me with the same expression he had the day we got married, biting his lip in delight. He gave me that look once when we were all day at the hospital waiting for an appointment. A big one, a last minute one, a life or death one, and we were nervous. When I went to get us something to eat, I was a connoisseur of hospital cafeterias by that time. I saw a worker so slow, she seemed to be getting the french fries one by one to fill the box. And when I got back, I acted it out for Michael, shuffling along with tiny steps and mumbling, and that's one french fry, and that's two french fries. Michael, she was so slow, I said. We were both fans of Rodney Dangerfield, and he knew his cue. How slow was she, Rodney? She was so slow, I said. By the time she finished, the kitchen mice had become management trainees. <laughs> so, Michael asked, and maybe he was serious, what was the problem? Well, I said, she was an older lady. And by this time, he had it down. And how old was she? Michael, she was so old, her high school picture was painted in a cave in France. <laughs> I loved how much he laughed. And I loved even more when he asked me to tell him that again, the whole thing, while he was waiting to find out what was going to happen to him. There are no monsters here. Instead, I said, dance for Grandma. Because I always said that when he asked me to perform some comment again and again. That's why I keep you around, around, he replied. We're loved. When you lose someone, you lose the dialect of memories. Now I'm the only one who knows that do you need a little there there has nothing to do with Gertrude Stein. It marked Michael's light bulb moment. He realized when I complained about work, he didn't have to fix it just to listen and sympathize. Ah, he said, his blue eyes widening. You want a little there, there. And he patted me on the shoulder. And then from then on, do you need a little there, there meant, do you need some comfort? He was sometimes too proud to say it, but I'd intuit it after he got sick. After a while, he didn't need to say it at all. 
The first year after he died, the memories literally paralyzed me. I got ambushed daily by situations that would trigger something either of us would say. A chance phrase overheard on the subway or a song lyric on the radio like, the original is still the greatest. I learned to function by writing it down and putting it in the Michael box, along with the cards and the photos, the comb with his hair, his cufflinks, the tie that is the exact color of his eyes. Only then could I could continue whatever I was doing. I needed a little there there. I'm still holding on to our language and memories six years later. I'm writing the, dis the dictionary of our relationship, but a language is a dialogue. You can't talk to a dictionary. When I feel a nice breeze on a balmy day, I still hear, nice day for something. And sometimes it is. But the toughest memories come with the things I said that made him laugh. I miss his laugh so much. Shut up. Michael always liked funny women. His friend Jim once told me it Michael always liked funny women, his friend Jim once told me. But it wasn't until after Michael passed that I discovered exactly how much it meant to him, too. The week before he died, I had told him about a dinner in Greenpoint. I had the Polish platter. What's that, he said. Oh, it's pierogies and kielbasa, I said. But after you get it, a German guy sits next to you and takes it away. <laughs> Bada bing. He laughed for a good minute, maybe more, and then we moved on to more serious topics, his upcoming biopsy. Afterwards, while planning his memorial service, I found a scribbled reminder on his desk. The Polish platter? When I turned on his computer, I found out why. He had an actual file called Burge's Greatest Hits. Long before the Michael Box, he had tallied the things he loved to hear me say. I'll drink to that, and Mauna Haya, the idioms of a relationship, the trip to Hawaii, the dinner at Lutece. The Polish platter was his last entry. I've been losing sleep over a turn of phrase he called nups because they were the opposite of puns. They came to me without thinking. Michael was the only one who caught them and he treasured them. He'd even mail them to friends. I don't remember any of the ones he, he loved. I've ransacked our papers, I've checked the emails. I can't find them, they're gone. Like my mother, I can't remember some of my words. I fear I'm losing my Italian too, losing a language for a community smaller than a Sicilian village, a nation of two, now one. But no matter what, I'll keep looking and remembering, appreciating each turn of phrase anew, savoring each moment and memory. I can hardly do otherwise. I'm the last speaker of us now. <laughs>